So welcome everyone to our webinar tonight, um, sponsored by the Office of Family Programs. I'm so pleased to present our colleagues who are from the Tulane Freeman School of Business Study Abroad and Exchange Program. And so now I will, my name is Penny Wyatt. I'm the Director of Family Programs. So happy to have all of you join us this evening. And we, I will um, gladly turn things over to my colleague, Mary uh, Hicks from Study Abroad in the Freeman School. And I will rejoin you at the Q&A time. Thank you, Penny. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mary Hicks. I will be your presenter today. And Penny will moderate our conversation. Um, also with us tonight, we have um, Aaron Forbes and Lauren Bix, members of our Freeman Abroad team and advisors to students. They're going to also help monitor all the questions. Um, so thank you the two of you for helping us out tonight. What we're going to go over tonight are, you know, the basics, um, our roles as advisors and your roles as family members, general program information, and then logistics, when, how, how much, safety, security, and then at the end we'll have our Q&A. So hopefully I can squeeze all this into our, um, our presentation tonight. So I'll try to talk kind of fast. My slides are on a timer. Um, okay, so let's go back to our staff. I'm the director of the Freeman Study Abroad and Exchange Office. Michelle Falgu is our executive secretary. Aaron Forbes is our senior pro program coordinator, primarily in charge of advising outbound students. And Lauren Bix is our senior program coordinator, primarily in charge of our inbound students. Um, so, we like to talk a little bit about who we are and what our roles are. Um, we are here as a resource for students. We're resources before, during, and after their study abroad experience. We are intercultural educators. We're able to assist students throughout the application and participation process. And we're part of a robust on-campus support system. We are not immigration and visa advisors, and we're not travel agents. We, we are also not on-site support. All of our partner universities have on-site support. And what about families? What kind of a role do you play in, um, in this process? You're a resource for students before, during, and after the study abroad experience. That's financial, emotional, logistical, et cetera. You're able to assist with certain needs during the application process, paperwork, I mean, the biggest one. And you're part of their support network, of course, a very important part. You are not necessarily going to fix all of their problems. Um, you're also not going to handle their organizational needs directly. It is very important that students take ownership of the entire application and pre-departure experience. At this level of logistical preparation, this preparing them for study abroad, it's very important for students to adult from here on out, right? So um, if you have questions about the program, it is good to start with your student. By you asking them questions, that prepares them to know what to ask us about, and it also forces them to be accountable for this information. In order for your student to be independent, they need to practice that independence. Study abroad is a great place to start, but we don't want them to start that after they're already abroad. We want them to start with that independence as soon as possible. It's also important to know that FERPA, the Family Educational Right to Privacy Act, protects your students' privacy while abroad, as well as while they're here. Our office is based in the United States, it's a US law. And your student is the only one who can waive their FERPA rights. Um, so it's important to know that we can't really discuss students' individual information unless they waive their FERPA rights, um, unless you're in the conversation with the student. So um, we do allow for parents to be in advising sessions. If, if you feel the need to be in it with them, then we can. Um, if you're calling about your student, please remember to provide their full name um, on the phone. Sometimes those things do have happen and I do welcome family phone calls, but it's important to keep that in mind. 
Now let's think about preparing your student. I'd like you to reflect a little bit about when was the first time you truly felt like an adult. Um, I mean, I think I thought I was an adult when I hit like 19. Um, now looking back, I don't think I was fully an adult at that point. You know, and so when you're looking at your student, are they an adult yet? Um, your relationship with them could be very different now than it is in high school. Well, study abroad is like next level, right? It's an additional negotiation of adulthood within this larger conversation. You know, they've already moved out of the nest. Now they're moving out of the country. They're moving to the other side of the world. They've got to figure out how to handle all of this stuff. It's a lot. And a lot of times family support is really important. So when you're preparing your student, it's, it's good to make sure that you're reinforcing that they understand this is way more than a vacation. They experience huge academic and personal growth, especially when they're expecting to have to go through these growth periods. In general, when students study abroad, they have increased hireability, adaptability, and intercultural communication skills. But they have to be expecting to go through this growth period. It can be, study abroad can be amazing, but it can also be scary, fun, depressing, confusing, amazing, overwhelming, all of those things. And families are an important part of the student support network. Uh, we've got that little quote from our student who went abroad in fall 2021 that he got good practice in adjusting to unfamiliar settings and persevering, persevering when I was in an uncomfortable situation. You know, across the board, I have counseled thousands of study abroad students. They all tell me very much similar things. When your student is calling you with problems, one thing that we like to think about is the power of the word yet. So if you use this kind of yet language and frame it in a way, it changes the way that they maybe see their problems, right? So, um, it encourages them to solve their own problems and reminds them that these pitfalls are not permanent, right? So having trouble with the language, it's like, well, you don't know how to offer, order your coffee in Spanish yet, but you can learn how to do it. Or I don't, I don't like this commute. Well, you know, you don't like it yet, but you know, you might get kind of used to it. And this is all part of the mindset. Does the student have the growth mindset that they need to go through this experience? When you have a fixed mindset, you're really limiting yourself. Whereas when you have a growth mindset and you allow yourself to go through these challenging experiences and you're trying new things, but you're expecting to, to learn and grow and be challenged, it's a very different mindset from this, I'm not good at this, I can't do this, I, 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 I'm gonna give up, I need to go home. I, I only know what I know. Uh, failure is the limit of my abilities rather than an opportunity to grow. It's okay to fail, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, and sometimes it can be quite stressful to be abroad and to be in these situations. And we want you to provide support. So encouraging that growth mindset, being like in their, in their camp, being their cavalry, not leading the way, but fighting with them to help them out and being a source of empowerment is an important part of the family's role. Sometimes parenting does is required, um, but hopefully you're mostly empowering your student. Our role is advising emotional support, intercultural coaching, academic and program advising and interfacing. We do provide in our office in Freeman Abroad a lot of academic support. And so students often can come to us for that in addition to all the other stuff. So, you know, when students are thinking about themselves studying abroad, a lot of times they're thinking about that whole social media thing, imagery that, that they see other people doing. They see themselves, as, you know, sitting in cafes on the streets of Europe, drinking fancy coffees. Um, it's not just that. It's so much more. It's academic, professional, and personal growth. And so if they have goals, in order to reach, you know, to, to reach for something bigger than just the travel experience and that social media kind of thing, then they're more likely to have a better experience and that growth mindset. Study abroad is living abroad. Going on one's own is a good thing. Everybody doesn't have to go with a group of friends. 
it's much more impactful to be in an experience where you're doing the learning and growing. And so if a student learns to expect that and learns that you know it's 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 something that they want to do, then it changes their whole attitude. There's been research done. I've got a link to where this research comes from that study abroad increases hiring and postgraduate acceptance potential. Um, networking is definitely a huge part of our exchange programs, gaining international perspectives, strengthening intercultural competencies, increased independence and empowerment, and de developing a heightened sense of adaptability are huge impacts that our students experience. Um, when studying abroad. Okay, let's talk some logistics. The Freeman Abroad programs are a little different from the programs offered in the Office of Study Abroad. First of all, all of our programs are direct enroll exchange programs. We manage a curated list of direct partnerships with top business schools around the world. Our participants become students at the partner institution and maintain their status as a two-way student. So there's students at two institutions at the same time. Because they enroll directly with the partner, however, they're required to participate in that host institution's practices and policies. So enrollment, academic calendars, student organizations, all that takes place with the host institution. Housing also. So if the host institution has institutional housing, students may take advantage of that. If the host institution does not, then no. Most of our partners offer different levels of, of housing options that students can avail themselves of. Another thing about becoming a student at two institutions is that you know we have those students, those incoming exchange students in our students place here on campus. Every semester we have anywhere between 70 and 100 international exchange students, uh, which is the largest group of international exchange students of any of the schools on campus. And we really treasure their presence, and we encourage our students to interact with them while they're here. Um, and especially after our students come back and they have experienced what it's like to be abroad, they sympathize with the exchange students. Um, and they, they love Tulane, they have a great time here, and we love to make sure that, that we've got lots of exchange happening both directions. Um, the program offerings are all over Europe, um, we have 12 programs in Asia, we have a summer program in the Middle East, five programs in Australia, seven in the Americas, and we have about 12 to 14 summer programs. And so then that's in 25 countries. We have a wide program offering. And so it's important for students to consider some of these programs that may not be in a singular destination. Now we have two different program structures. Our semester and fall, I mean, our semester programs in fall and spring, students pay two lane tuition and fees that allows their financial aid and scholarships to apply as normal. Other expenses are paid directly, however. So the, the tuition, tuition and fees are the only thing that are paid directly to Tulane. The housing, flights, visa fees, and things like that are paid directly to whatever source needs that, that payment. It is one general common application where the students list their host university preferences. They list up to five host institutions um, as in order of preference. We do placement after the February 5th deadline. And uh, at that point, when we've offered them placement, there is a $500 commitment deposit that is required. For the summer programs, it's a program fee. And that includes different things. It always includes tuition but it, and insurance, but sometimes it includes housing, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the program. Um, additional expenses like airfare are usually paid directly. Students apply directly to their program of interest, so it's not the common application like our semester programs. And we have rolling admission for those, and there is also a $500 commitment deposit. Our partners offer these summer programs, and so it's a wide variety of offerings. So if a student is interested in a summer, they should definitely come and talk to us. Um, like I said, we have about 14 programs. We're still receiving updates from partners, so our website is, is still not up to date yet. But as we receive those updates, then we update our website. Um, anywhere from three to 12 credits, anywhere from two to six or eight weeks, 
program formats are very different and the academic focuses can be very different. We have one on sports uh, event management, sports and event management in France that really sounds cool. Um, we have Copenhagen Business School where you can take all kinds of different classes. Um, just depends. Oh, doing business in China is another one that's popular. Uh, so we have lots of different summer offerings. But let's go back to the semester programs. So our most well-known program is the ICADE Business School program in Madrid, Spain. That's our largest um, exchange. We send and receive a lot of students with ICADE. So um, if you're walking around the B school during family week, you might notice groups of Spanish students speaking Spanish with each other and break into them, ask them if they're from ICADE. Um, and we'll be sending a large number of students in the fall of 2025. Um, ICADE is known for its finance program. It's an excellent business school. It's an old university. Uh, it's a Jesuit university. It's really a fantastic program. The Copenhagen Business School is also fantastic, well-known for finance, but offers um, classes in all kinds of different areas. Um, Sciences Po in Reims, France, which is their main campus, is one of the top universities in all of France. Really a great opportunity for our students to be able to um, study in France. Vienna University of Economics and Business in Austria is also an excellent business school, uh, really offers some in inventive type of classes. We also partner with National University of Singapore. Um, they're the top business school in Asia and really, um, really are top rate. I mean, they're an excellent business school. Curtin University in Perth, Australia is one of our fun partners. They, um, it's, a, it's the entire university. It's not just a business school. Students can take classes in business or not in business. Um, and they happen to have, have a park in the middle of their campus where you can interact with wildlife. We probably not interact that much, but, um, they can see koala when they walk from the dorms to the classrooms. It really looks like a beautiful campus. And then Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia is one of the top business schools in um, South America. And our students really have had fantastic experiences there. They offer a great summer program as well. Okay, so a lot of our students are currently asking, should I do Freeman or should I do OSA? We have opened up a list of programs in the next slide, we'll talk about that, um, that are pre-approved for business credit transfer. In general, when we're talking with students and they're trying to make the decision as to which office they wanna go with, um, we, we talk about these, these points. All are exchange programs in Freeman, whereas with OSA, most of their programs are provider or hybrid programs. In Freeman, all of our business courses are vetted and students are guaranteed credit transfer into the BSM degree. So if students' academic progress is their top priority, then we suggest going with a Freeman program. For OSA programs, business students generally pursue either all non-business credits or a combination of business and non-business classes. Um, our partners through Freeman are some of the top business schools in the world. You really get a first-rate business education. Um, and we have the one common application for several programs. So the issue with the one common application and the fact that we have limited spots at each partner means that students might need to be a little more flexible with regard to uh, location. So they can't necessarily just say, I wanna go to this one place and then they can go there. They have to request placement. And if we're able to place them there, then we can send them. We do try to send students to their top choice institution but there's never a guarantee at this point. Um, another couple of things about the OSA programs. Some are pre-approved by business. I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, but there's less guarantee of credit usage. So the business credit is what I'm talking about. All the credits transfer to Tulane, but whether or not they can use that towards their business degree is the, the next question. So we do try to help them with that, but we can't always because it's not our programs. Um, and with OSA, you apply for the program that you want. And in general, you know, you can go on that program. So choosing a location is much simpler with their programs. So um, this next slide is a, is a screenshot of our website, um, which I have linked in this slide. So if you click on um, 
this link right here, you will get to this page and you can click on the non-Freeman study abroad um, tab, which will give you lots of information about the non-Freeman option for Freeman students. Um, so the short answer is that they can go on those programs. Long answer is the business credits aren't guaranteed. Um, and so if business credits are most important for a student, we suggest applying through Freeman. All right, so back to Freeman Abroad programs. The benefits of these programs are that they can take business classes not available at Tulane. Really some great um, classes. One of our students took finance major a couple years ago, took financial bubbles and crashes at Oslo, in Oslo at BI Norwegian. She said it was the best, um, it was the best finance class she took in her entire college career. They can transfer 12 to 18 business credits. They can take classes taught in English, although some of our partners do offer um, classes taught in the local language if someone is fluent. Students maintain Tulane status, therefore their financial aid and scholarships usually apply. And they have access to full Tulane services. Um, so Crisis 24, which we'll talk about later, the travel services, advising, success coaching, all the stuff that comes with being a Tulane student. It is important to remember that there are certain things that we cannot do in this office. One is apply for housing on behalf of students. We do not enroll students in classes at the host institutions. We cannot alter foreign transcripts. So when we receive a transcript, we have to report the grades that are officially on those transcripts. Um, and I'll talk about the grading as well in a little while. We also cannot apply for student visas on behalf of students, and we cannot ever intervene with a foreign country or a partner institution's policies and or procedures. So it is important that students are educating themselves on the host institution and the host, in, uh, host country's um, policies, procedures, laws, and those sorts of things. Okay, so let's go over some logistics. Students generally study abroad during their junior year at Tulane. They can get advised at any time. So they can start as a freshman coming to our office. We, we don't turn away anybody who wants to start planning early for study abroad. Most students plan to go after the spring semester of their sophomore year, so the first semester of the junior year, which is fall. The eligibility requirements are that they complete those lower division business core requirements before they go abroad. But they maintain a 2.5 Freeman GPA, that's in the business school, and that they maintain good academic, financial, and disciplinary standing at Tulane. So they can't, you know, be on probation or have any kind of sanctions against them. In general, students start their applications about a year in advance. So right now, students are applying for fall 2025. This is that list. Last year, we had a parent asking for the list of the lower division business core. So these are the prerequisites plus the lower division business core that students really should have done before they study abroad. It looks like a lot, but most of our students are able to complete these before they go abroad. I will mention that our curriculum is changing. So if you're a parent of a current freshman, that MCOM 3200, is no longer going to be required before students study abroad for the fall 2026 um, cohort. And also CDMA 2201 it will replace 1201 and students don't necessarily have to take it before they study abroad. But for the most part, they need to get those basic business credits out of the way. Why? Because they take upper level business electives when they study abroad. So we want them to be prepared for taking those electives. Another reason is they only have three semesters when they come back. So if they come back and they're behind in their business curriculum, it'll be difficult for them to finish the, the curriculum on time. So we're really trying to keep them on track and make sure that they can study what they need to study abroad and that they can complete their degree in uh, four years. Most of our students study abroad in fall, but we really like to encourage students to consider the spring semester um, some of those benefits are that we have additional partner programs. Some of our partner programs don't um, align with our fall academic calendar, but you could go in spring. Uh, examples for those are ECHEC in Brussels, SRH Berlin, University of Innsbruck. Some of them, like in Germany and Austria, start after Mardi Gras. So you could 
students could stay for Mardi Gras and then go abroad for their spring program. Um, some of our partners offer more classes in spring, particularly uh, Copenhagen Business School and Vienna University of Economics and Business. Um, there's definitely a higher likelihood of students' acceptance into their top choice. Because we don't have as many students competing for spots in the spring, it's easier for us to award those places to our spring students. In general, also, there's much less of a two-lane bubble when they go in the spring. Um, that social bubble is definitely something that our students have complained about, in fact. Students who expected to meet local people and really get immersed in the culture, if they're surrounded by too many other Tulane students, they have difficulty breaking out of that bubble and having that sort of special study abroad experience. In spring, more holidays, better weather, and you can have that travel time after the semester is over. So we generally like students to consider studying abroad in spring. All right, how does this thing work? Um, they are exchanged. So the number of spots that we have for our students that are outbound is governed by how many students we've been able to send from each institution. So every institution's number that we have for fall is negotiated every year by our office. And so it's gonna be slightly different. Most of them are, are small. Um, many are 10 or fewer, some are 10 or 15. Ikade is our only large one where we'll be sending probably about 80 students in the fall. The rest of them are completely different scale. Students maintain their Tulane status. They also become a student at the partner institution, so they're maintaining status at two institutions at the same time. They enroll in courses at the host institution, and um, credits and grades are transferred in as business electives general business electives and major electives, and they count towards the BSM degree. I have restrictions applied there in parentheses because a student's major um, and minor in business choice might change how those electives are distributed, which is why we do a lot of academic advising with our office and with the student's major advisors. All right, so how do they earn credit? After transcripts are received from the host institutions, it's applied to each student's degree. It can take up to two thirds or three quarters of the following semester for those grades to show in, in Gibson. Um, but generally we get those in as soon as we receive that transcript. Those, trans those business courses transfer automatically as general or major electives. Non-business courses transfer automatically as general electives or like floating electives. Um, unless the student gets permission from the individual department. So like if they take an anthropology class, they get approval from anthropology to transfer the class, then they can use that towards some sort of requirement outside of the B-School. There are some NTC core requirements that students can satisfy while they're abroad. Global Perspectives is one. They do have to do an NTC petition. They should speak to their NTC advisor about that. We usually counsel students on that when we're working with them. And definitely we want them meeting with their major and academic advisors during the entire process to discuss these courses. And it's important to remember that grades from study abroad will appear as letter grades on the transcript, but they won't be calculated into the GPA. So it, we call it like fancy pass fail, um, but it is important for them to know that if they make a grade that's not the best, it is gonna show on the transcript. All right, how does cost work? Students pay base tuition plus the academic and study abroad fees. The academic fee is $1,400 and the study abroad fee is $1,200. This is listed on our website on every brochure page. Students do not pay campus fees. So that's your um, campus activities fee, your um, student health center fee, and the Riley Center fee. Each student is required to pay a non-refundable non $500 commitment deposit when they commit to a, a program. As long as the student participates in the program, that, that deposit is returned after the student shows up on site. So usually if they're going to brought in fall, they pay the deposit in spring, and then it gets credited back to their account after they, our partner reports that they're attending in fall. 
scholarships and financial aid apply as they do in a regular semester, international health insurance and emergency services are included in the program. All other expenses are paid directly to the provider. So that's, again, housing, visa fees, travel expenses, those sorts of things. The cost of living can vary widely. Um, and we do have cost estimates available on our website. On each brochure page, there's a tab for costs. And students can look at that, and they can actually edit those estimated costs based upon their own um, circumstances. So we strongly suggest that students do that when they're comparing programs to think about what um, what their expenses might be for the semester. And certainly, they can share that with you. Um, now, housing, local arrangements are made according to the host university's facilities and locations. For example, ICADE does not have any housing, so students have to find their own housing. ICADE does make suggestions for agencies that students can use to book housing, but um, students are on their own to find housing. BI Norwegian in Oslo, they guarantee housing for international students. Fantastic. Vienna, there's an Austrian government housing agency that students can utilize if they wish to. But of course, students can also opt into independent housing. Housing opportunities do vary widely from institution to institution. And so, you know, it's important that students are staying informed about all of this. And if that's a critical piece of their application process, that they consider that when they're applying, when they're requesting host institutions. Um, all right, so what about housing at Tulane? Because there's this new housing requirement that's applicable to this year's sophomores. So essentially next year's juniors are required to stay on campus unless they go abroad in the fall. So what we're seeing is an uptick in applications of students who wanna go abroad in fall because they wanna be released from that on-campus housing requirement for the returning spring semester. So if a student studies abroad in fall, they are released from that on-campus requirement. The housing office does confirm study abroad participation with both the NTC study abroad office and our office. So if a student um, ends up pulling out, they will be required to stay on campus. Um, but if they are released from that requirement, they're not guaranteed house on-campus housing for spring. And it, if they end up needing a subletter, sometimes that can be difficult to find. And so sometimes students are, are paying for housing in New Orleans as well as abroad. Um, and so we've got this little estimate worked out that a full year of housing would be more expensive if they went abroad in the fall and couldn't get on-campus housing in the spring, whereas with spring, they have to live on campus in the fall, but then they don't have to worry about subletting anything because then they can just move out for the spring and go to study abroad and then come back and have housing for their senior year. Um, all students can live off campus for their senior year. So that's basically how that new housing requirement, we're, how we're seeing it impact our study abroad applications. So how do students apply? Basically in their sophomore year, they start planning, they come to us, they can go to our website and open their application or they can come have an appointment with us and we can start an application for them. Um, those links are to our website and to our make an appointment site. Uh, we encourage students to meet with us when they're starting to consider their options. It's a lot, you know, so we want them to really have as much information in front of them as they can. And we expect the students to research the different program offerings based upon their own personal goals and objectives. So we talk to them a lot about, like, what do you want to get out of the study abroad experience? What are your goals? And it needs to be more than just, I want to travel to Paris. Right? It needs to have some academic professional goals in mind so that you can put forward a, a really solid application. So our deadlines are the same every year. Spring is September 5th, fall is February 5th, and summer is variable. Um, so that February 5th deadline is the next one that's coming up. So our students are preparing now and they're researching all these different host institutions in order to um, request placement. The application timeline is basically that once the, once that application deadline is passed, we will offer placement decisions in about 10 to 14 days. It will take us about two weeks. Students will then have about seven days to commit or not. 
And if they have questions, they're definitely encouraged to meet with us. Um, and then they start the secondary application phase, pre-departure orientation, visa application things. So the, you know, the body of work that needs to be done after they accept placement um, is, you know, is part of the deal. It's a lot. Let's talk about placement. How are students placed? Basically, um, when we know we have a certain number of places at a host institution, if we receive more requests for that host institution than there are spots available, then we're, we're ranking the students. So ranking and placement is based upon those eligibility requirements and the quality of the application. So students who are closer to completing the lower division business core, the, all those classes that I showed you, they have a high Freeman GPA, and they submit a well-written uh, application with thoughtful responses to the prompts within the application. Um, they will have a better chance of having placement at their top choice uh, host institution. That host university request list where they're requesting placement also um, acts as a wait list if the student is not placed in their top choice. So let's say a student gets into their second choice. Um, they accept, they commit, they pay the $500 deposit, but then a spot opens up because some other student has to withdraw from their top choice institution. If this student is, is the next one on the list, because we've got this default wait list, we might offer them that spot and then they, they, and they can decide whether they want to go with the, the top choice or the second choice. They can keep the second choice, but they can opt for their first choice at that point in time. The $500 deposit follows their application. So they don't lose the money. Um, we're trying to place students at their top choice, but we can't always do that. So we recognize, and we're, we're not making them put their names on a wait list again, right? We're just using the existing information to keep what we call a default wait list. So after placement, it's really exciting because students know where they're going and we put them in touch with other students going. They have to commit to their program and pay that deposit. Then we nominate them to the host institution according to that institution's schedule. And then we're trying to encourage the students to really research the host institution, really look at what kind of classes they really think they're gonna take. A lot of times the, the class information for that semester might be available or available soon. What's the academic culture of that host institution? You know. What's the expectations of the press professors? What do people normally wear to class? What about student groups? What's the local language and culture like? And then all kinds of other interesting details based upon their own interests, goals, and objectives. We also provide them with a list in their portal of prior study abroad participants and incoming exchange experience uh, the students. So they can reach out to folks who have either been to um, where they're going or are here from that host institution. So we really want students to start getting excited about where they're going and learn more about their destination. Of course, in order to travel, we all have to have passports. The passport needs to be valid uh, when they start their study abroad application. So right now, if a student does not have a valid passport, we are telling them they need to get the, a new passport ASAP because it has to be valid for at least six months after the study abroad program ends. And if they don't have um, that passport when they apply, it's um, many of our partner institutions require the passport in order to process their applications. So they, their, their application to the host institution could be delayed. And then their, their um, student visa application might be delayed if they don't have a passport. So it's really important to get that in place ASAP. Um, and if a student is carrying a passport, a five-year passport that's uh, from when they were young, uh, it's not a renewal application, it's a new passport application. So you have to kind of build it out time for that or pay for the expedited service. Most of our students do have to apply for a student visa. Um, some countries don't require it, but it depends on the country. And whatever they have to submit in terms of the application and the supplementary, supplementary documents can vary widely from country to country and sometimes from consulate to consulate. Those requirements are generally extremely detailed and students really have to read the instructions very carefully. This is something that we are always 
trying to help students with. We are not immigration and visa advisors, but we can look at a list of requirements and talk to the students about what it says and help them kind of like understand this new language. We do also, um, we are providing batch visa processing again for the students going to Spain. Um, there's been some developments with the way that the Spanish government accepts the student visa applications. They're using an agency called BLS International in our, we go through the Houston office. Um, some students in 2024 had difficulties in submitting their applications to BLS Houston. It was the first time that BLS had started accepting these applications and there were quite a few hiccups. So we're gonna do the batch visa process and try to make it um, better for our students and um, hopefully provide that service to them. But of course, if students wanna apply independently, but through the consulate that they are under the jurisdiction of, like New York, Chicago, Miami, they certainly can, and we can we can kind of counsel them on that as well. Um, booking travel. So Tulane's must Tulane students must book travel through the Concur online travel service and or the World Travel Service that Tulane offers. Basically, we learned in COVID that Tulane needs to be able to provide support in case of any kind of emergency that crops up. And we can do that most efficiently if the travel is all booked through the travel agency that manages Tulane travelers. So all Tulane travelers, faculty, staff, students have to book their travel through Concur. And if they need help from a travel agent, they can contact World Travel Service. I recommend World Travel Service for international travel. They are very helpful. Um, it's not that expensive. It's like a, a fee, a one-time fee of like $20 per itinerary or something like that. Um, and it makes a big difference to be able to talk to a human being. Students can access Concur travel via Gibson. So when they log into Gibson, it's one of the links, one of those many links on the left-hand side of the page. Um, and then in there, is contact information for World Travel Services. So, um, yes. Now, what about safety? Personal safety and responsibility are central themes of the pre-departure orientation and our messaging to students. It is really important that they're taking care of themselves. Um, so that means while they're there, but also before they go, that they need to think carefully about those safety issues. They should check the U.S. Department of State and CDC websites for travel advisories. Um, Tulane does monitor those advisories and does reserve the right to cancel any program in a location that's considered unsafe. Um, so, you know, there have been times when we have had to pull programs, um, but usually Tulane is very careful, you know, to consider the whole picture. International health insurance is included in the program. We are changing insurance providers to uh, this agency called Chubb, and we will have more detailed information available for students very soon, but it's um, it's a better policy and better coverage. So I think uh, students will not be upset by that. We also provide the Crisis 24 International Travel Safety and Emergency Provider. That's a, a graphic of their app um, that students should all download. So students are automatically enrolled in Crisis 24 when they book via Concur. Um, we ask them all to download this app. It's got an easy to use hotline. They have a crisis signal. Um, they have local emergency numbers. They really do help students find local providers. I had a student just last week who um, ended up in the hospital. It wasn't very serious, but they needed local support. And um, he and his mother were able to work with Crisis 24, who immediately notifies our crisis te management team on campus at Tulane in order to make sure that he was well taken care of. So it's a very important piece of our safety management protocol uh, that all students are looped into Crisis 24. We, we also suggest that students check those advisories. And then once all their trip details are known, we require students to enroll in the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, that's STEP, through the U.S. Department of State, so that our country also has a bead on 
which U.S. citizens are in each place. That's really used by the U.S. Department of State just to um, just to make sure that if they have, you know, there's any sort of a catastrophe, <clears throat> that they have a list of, you know, citizens in whatever place that the catastrophe takes place. For example, the floods that had just happened in Spain, the U.S. Department of State was probably checking in with all of the, the known travelers, U.S. citizens, um, that would be in, in that area to make sure that they were safe. Um, so there are redundancies in some of these protocols. It's really important that we have them. We take our students' safety and security very seriously. And, you know, there's a certain amount of um, control that we can't have. And so we have these protocols in place. So, all right, I think that's it for the, the body of information that we have. We, um, we're happy to Take any questions at this point? Penny, do you want to? Oh, my slideshow ended. There we go. Yes. So families, now is the time for you to submit your questions. Um, so you type those in that um, Q&A feature. Um, one of the questions was, how would we know if our student is through Freeman Study Abroad or Newcomb? So I think that you've answered this, but um, if you want to explain a little bit about that, Mary. Yeah. Again. So we can only service Freeman students. So if a student is not a business major, they can't enroll in our, our programs. They're uh, even the system electronically, like it won't work. Um, but Freeman students have the choice to do either office. So Freeman students need to look at if they're interested in programs in the NTC pro, uh, office, their suite of programs, or in our office. And so that's why we have that conversation with students we also talk about it in the info sessions that we do with students. We have those scheduled. They're listed on our website. We encourage students to come to that because, you know, a lot of times they're, they're trying to gather as much information as they can to make an informed decision, which is what we want them to do. So the next question is, can the students go abroad during their senior year? Yes, but um, if they're going abroad during their graduating semester, they won't be able to get their diploma during that semester. They would have to apply for graduation in the subsequent semester. Um, so if they were going abroad in spring, I think I have a student going abroad next spring, they're gonna apply for graduation for August or December, depending upon when we receive the transcript from the host institution. And Mary, does that require any additional fees if they're, if, if they're going to apply for graduation in a subsequent semester just so it lines up with when those courses will get credited? No, I don't think the students pay any kind of tuition. They do have to pay a fee to apply for graduation. Okay. Um, and they can walk. So like if a student were finishing in fall and they weren't going to technically graduate until May or August, they could still walk in May. Students often, or if they're, you know, if they want to walk early, if they're going to graduate in December, they can walk in May. Okay. Um, is a student allowed to apply through Freeman Study Abroad as well as the NTC Study Abroad? Technically, yes. So they are able to do it. Um, we don't recommend this because we want them to make a conscious decision as to which one is better for them. And it kind of gums up the works. Um, so what we're looking at is probably OSA, the other study abroad office, will have to um, hold off on the students that have dual applications until they know whether they're offered a Freeman spot. So it might slow the, the OSA or the NTC application. Um, so it's a little it's a little messy if they do that. Yeah. The next question is. Housing is not guaranteed for spring semester. When will the students know if they have housing? That might be a, a question that we would have okay. to pose to the housing office. So you could email housing at tulane.edu to, to ask that question. I would just say that that might be the best thing for the parent who posed that question because it's awfully busy the next two days um, on campus for us with family weekend and everything. And I, I fear I wouldn't get an I might not be able to get an answer to that question um, right away. 
um, in time for me to send that with the um, the follow up message with the the slides and everything. So pose those questions to um, housing at tulane.edu. We are also going to have another webinar um, later this month, no, in December, I think, um, about housing for the next year. And some of those questions might be answered in that as well. So you may even just want to watch the archive for a new webinar to pop up on that topic. It'll be about you know, housing for the future, um, both off-campus options and how the new um, third year on-campus requirement affects, you know, what students are looking at. So the next question is, can you request housing on campus for second semester junior year in fall, if if going abroad in the fall? So I think that's kind of the same question. You can request it but it's not guaranteed, right? So um, the next question is, what if more students apply than there are spots in the particular program they're interested in? So if more students apply, then there are spots. That's when the ranking comes into place. So that's why we ask them to list up to five host institutions. So if we cannot offer placement to a student in their top choice because maybe students have stronger applications than they have, then we'd go to their second choice and on down the line. Okay. Um, international insurance applies even if you select, or, or does international insurance apply even if you select to provide your own insurance versus two-lane insurance? This is health insurance. Yeah, okay. So students cannot opt out of the international health insurance. They have it no matter what. Okay. Um, so, but it is important to remember that they also have to maintain their domestic health insurance. Um, and so, you know, if they do T-SHIP, that's fine. If they do a T-SHIP waiver, they have to go through that like they normally do. Because if something were to happen and they were to come back, they need to have that domestic health insurance in place. So they have to continue that domestic coverage. And we just cover all of our travelers no, you know, nobody gets to opt, to opt out. It doesn't change the fees in any way. Yeah. Okay. It's included in the fees that they pay for study abroad programming. Right. Okay. Um, how does your office work with the Altman Scholar students? Or do Pretty you? closely. Okay. Yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Altman Scholars have to spend a semester abroad with the NTC study abroad office and a semester abroad with Freeman. And so we triangulate pretty heavily with the Altman um, program manager, the Office of Study Abroad and Freeman. So yeah, we work very closely with them. Um, this question sounds from the way it's worded that it's coming from a student. If I have citizenship in Italy and would like to go to school there, can I apply to the school directly and not through Tulane? Also with a year since, this person has a European European passport, do they need a student visa? Okay, so the last question is the easiest one to answer. No, you don't need a student visa. You can enter Italy with your Italian passport and you're good. Um, but if you decide to separate from Tulane and enroll in, a, in an international university directly, um, first of all, if it's a partner with Freeman, um, that university will not accept you. But if it's not, then you would be leaving the university and then you would have to transfer the credits back to Tulane. And then you are um, you must follow the credit transfer rules for NTC and for Freeman. Freeman restricts the incoming business credit transfer to up to six credits. And they, it has to be an AACSB accredited institution. And um, there's something else that I'm forgetting. Um, it has to be pre-approved. Oh, and it has to be, the, the classes have to have Tulane equivalents. So this idea of taking fun electives that are not available at Tulane is not really an option when you're transferring credit. So it's much more difficult to go on leave of absence, which is what that's called, and then come back to Tulane and transfer credits. Um, so, right. That's one of the reasons we provide this service is so that students can easily transfer credits. 
Okay. So we're coming to the end of the hour, but our um, panelists have agreed to stay a little bit longer. So families, we're going to try to get through some more of these questions that um, have been posed. So um, I just wanted to let you know, we're going to go a little bit past the, the hour. So um, one question is, what if your student receives housing and academic accommodations at Tulane through the Goldman Center for Student Accessibility? How are accommodations like those handled abroad? Yeah, good question. Um, so the Americans with Disabilities Act is a U.S. law. Um, and so other countries might have similar laws, but they're not necessarily the same. Most of our partner institutions do provide accommodations as long as students declare those and provide documentation. Um, but we don't have any kind of control over whether or not they can provide those accommodations or will provide them. And we can't you know, make anyone provide accommodations outside of the U.S. Um, so, but most of our partners do their best to provide as many accommodations as they can. Okay. Um, are students able to apply to third party business school study abroad programs? So something completely outside of what you're offering through Freeman. And so I guess third that party means, meaning I get, I'm the person who submitted this question to maybe clarify for us, but I'm going to guess that that means could they apply to another school's international program? a business school pro study abroad program independent of Tulane? They can. Um, it would be the same thing that we talked about before. So the student would declare a leave of absence. Um, they have to go through a couple of procedures here in order to you know, announce that they're planning to come back because they separate from the university. So when they do that, they have to transfer the credits back just like they would if they went to you know, Columbia University for a semester. Um, and, um, and you know, they, they have to follow those transfer credit rules. Um, and they also are not, um, they can't avail themselves. They're not a Tulane student at that point. They don't have their email. They can't get advising. You know, it's really kind of tricky um, for us to help those students. Okay. Um, so another question is, if a student ranks five programs, are they guaranteed to receive a placement in one of the programs? Um, and, you know, like based on the anticipated increase in applicants, how do you foresee the, that the impact of, on the likelihood of getting a first or second choice? Yeah, so um, there is no way to forecast those numbers, unfortunately. Um, and we can never guarantee placement, unfortunately. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, for the students who come and talk to us and they put programs on their request list that are not the ones that everybody else is requesting, then they have a greater likelihood of receiving placement. Um, the students that last year had the most difficulty were the ones that listed only three programs and they were the ones that everybody else was requesting. And so then we were able to offer those students spots at other fantastic schools um, that still had spaces available. So some of them took advantage of that offer. Some of them didn't. Uh, it's up to the student. But, um, you know, this is why we're really trying to get across the message that students need to consider programs that are not, um, not the same place as everybody else, you know. They need to consider getting outside of that two-lane bubble and um, going on programs that maybe they hadn't considered and maybe aren't in capital cities um, because they're going to have a fully immersive experience and truly, you know, like academic, um, academically rewarding rather than, um, you know, this idea of kind of a travel semester. Um, here's a great question. Is the basic information explained in this evening pretty similar to the travel information for Tulane's Altman Study Abroad program? Oh, I'm not sure what Altman is telling your students. Okay. So yeah. we need yes. you to, we need you parents to kind of evaluate both, both possibilities. There's also a question about 
whether or not this will be similar to what is being offered at family weekend this weekend. So I will say that um, we did have a, a webinar in October on the Newcomb Tulane College study abroad programs, and that is going to be reprised at family weekend. So that whole presentation will be done again. So if you want to free up more space in your, your schedule for this Friday, if you're um, joining us for family weekend this week, then you might want to um, go ahead and get that information um, online and look at that in our, um, in our archive on the website. Um, but um, Mary and some of her other colleagues will be available at an open house that's more of a drop-in style. So it's not a formal presentation like this, but um, you would be able to just drop in and chat with them. And that it, it's two to three. Is that correct, Mary? Four. Two to four. four. Um, in the business building, room 202. It's at the top of the spiral stairs. So when you come in that 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 foyer in the in the in the front of the business building, there's a huge spiral staircase on the right. Go up to the top of that, and we'll be in the room right there. And it's not just our office; it's all of um, the like the Freeman experience for so the undergraduate office. So we've got Career Management Center is going to be there, LePage Center is going to be there, Academic Advisors are going to be there, um, as well as study abroad, so that parents and students can come in and ask questions of all kinds of different people. Um, when do students typically leave for fall semester abroad if they're going to do a fall program? Are they usually on the same kind of schedule that we are on or does it vary from program, program to program? Okay. Right. So these are partner institutions. They're academic institutions. So they have academic start and end dates and they have orientation dates that they inform students of and students must um, abide by the host institution's academic schedule. Um, if it's if it's more likely this year that students won't get a spot from the free with, within one of the Freeman abroad programs, should they also apply to OSA as a backup if they if they really want to study abroad experience? Right. Um, Again, it's it's allowed. So if they really do want to to kind of have that in there and have it as a backup, they can do that. Yes. Um, I'm going to try to take a couple more questions. You mentioned that Concur is available on the Gibson portal. It, um, where is World Travel Service located? Is it also in the portal, or is it from a website URL? It's so the they they um, generally like you to. Know, Call them or email them, and that information is inside Concur. Okay, it's listed inside the Concur app part or portal. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. like a there's like a tab. If you click more information, it it drops down this huge menu of all kinds of information, and you scroll through it. Okay. The one question it. is, what if um the family has um airline mileage mm -hmm. that they could use for flights? Or they do they still have to book everything through the two they concurrent don't. And, and right and so the travel management office generally will uh, grant an exception so a student just needs to email that and these instructions are in the student portals they email travel at tulane.edu and request an exception based upon this this request the mileage request and okay. then if the travel management office does grant that exception. They also send the student instructions to enroll in Crisis 24, which is the important piece. That's the other piece of using Concur is that Crisis 24 enrollment. Um, are there scholarships or financial aid available for study abroad? There are. Um, we have a Freeman Travel Abroad Award um, that students can apply for. It's not a huge amount, but it, it helps. It's drop in the bucket. But we also have lists on our website of um, external scholarships that students can apply for. Um, if my student was required to take a class over the summer, would they still be able to go abroad in the spring? So I guess it might depend on when that international programs end date is for their semester. 
So yeah. I think that student would have to carefully consider those different dates and how that lines up. Yeah, mm -hmm. the academic calendar dates are definitely something that we're we're trying to make sure the students are all looking at, even for fall semester, um, because we don't want them to choose a program that's going to end in January and not have any kind of special accommodations for North American students. Some of our partners do, some of our partners don't. Same thing for spring. You know, if you're looking at spring dates, you need to look at, and, you're, and you've got an internship or a class in the summer, you're, you should be looking at those dates when you're doing the application. And that information is on the brochure page for every program. Okay. So here's a good question, because I think it, um, I hope that your answer will help parents prompt their students to think really divergently about this or kind of think deeper about this. How does it work if my student wants to go to a location with a few friends? So our program does not place students based upon groups. Um, and so, yes, we encourage students to consider going with, you know, fewer, like maybe not necessarily the same friends that they want to go with. If location is the number one priority and academics take a little bit of a backseat, then they can apply to an OSA program. We have the list of pre-approved programs. Students can apply directly for the program. They can all apply. And if they're all accepted, then they can go as a group. But our, our programs are not group-based. And, and I, you know, yeah. So <laughs> when a student goes in a group, it is very difficult um, to socially integrate, especially, you know, so when you're at orientation, you can think about like when our students come here and we've got students from Norway, from Denmark, from Spain, from uh, Singapore, and the students who are kind of sitting alone next to somebody from somewhere else start up a conversation. But if you've got the students who are in the groups where they're all speaking their own native language, they're not integrating as well as the students who are one and one and one. Um, and so I think it's really beneficial for students to kind of put themselves out there a little bit and to go without that friend safety network. They're gonna have a safety network. They're gonna be there with students who are having similar experiences, but they might not be from the US. They might be from the US, but they might not. And everybody's kind of going through all this at the same time. It's like we said before, it's stressful, it's overwhelming. It's exciting. All that new stuff that you're going through at the beginning, you have that shared experience with other students. You build really deep relationships pretty quickly that way. And But if you're already in a friend group, it's really hard to break out of that little bubble. And so we encourage students to kind of maybe diverge, that word, from that way of thinking. And it's it's such a transformative experience to really put themselves out there and to do something different from what their friends might be doing and um, have those extra challenges, but the rewards can be so great um, when they live through that experience and manage that. Empowerment is incredible. Like it really does um, change how students see themselves, how they see the world. Um, you just really, you kind of can't put, you can't put a, a label on it. It's really, it's difficult to explain. Um, and sometimes students don't even realize it until like a couple of years after they get back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really, the impact of this is usually kind of pretty long lasting, if not lifelong. Right. And so the parents' longer term perspective and more years and experience of growth through challenges like that can be, that's where you can really kind of help them have a broader, deeper perspective on some of these things. Um, because you can appreciate those things that they might not be able to appreciate in advance or in the moment, or even like you said, immediately after. Sometimes all that stuff will kind of coalesce and and really um, come together after they've returned. So, um, so speaking of return, um, we need to kind of wrap things up here. Um, and so you see the email address to reach out if if we didn't get to your question. But I just wanted to kind of put in a plug that those of you who are on this particular um, webinar might not need this when we offer in January, but I want you to know that we're going to start offering a family webinar about the re-entry process for students coming back from study abroad. So we're going to do that for the first time 
this January into 2025. And so we hope that'll go well and we'll continue to do that just on a regular cycle like we've been doing the study abroad webinars. So, you know, my colleagues here have, you know, they assist students with this, but sometimes, as Mary said, students don't even quite recognize it when it's happening. So we feel like if we clue parents into that process that students go through, that even that then returning has some challenges and some growth um, opportunities and some things to maximize that really makes the most of the whole study abroad experience, um, that they come back with new perspectives, they might approach some of their studies differently, and they might might help them um, in defining their career interest. Those kind of things can emerge from a study abroad program. So if we can um, help parents understand about that return process and so that they can offer even more guidance to their students and kind of partner with us to make sure the students maximizing what they what they do when they get back, then we think that'll be a wonderful addition to what we're offering um, everybody. So um, so I, I think that we're going to have to end here because it's almost like a quarter of the hour past our time. So I will just say again, if you're coming this weekend, um, then you might want to stop by um, the Freeman Experience um, um, open house because it'll be more than just um, Mary as she explained to her some of their other colleagues will be there but if you've still got one short question that you didn't get to um, answer to, um, question we didn't get to answer tonight then drop by that or email them at freemanabroad at tulane.edu and we're really grateful that for your interest tonight and um, I just want to thank um, um, everybody um, Mary and Lauren and um who else are, and Aaron as well for just um, helping in the background and helping us manage the questions and um, thank you for all of this wonderfully thorough information the parent participants on the webinar if you have any feedback about the content of the webinar or suggestions for others um, we'd appreciate it if you email families at tulane.edu some of you um, gave us some little emojis to provide feedback so we appreciate that having that in the moment too so we're always open to your suggestions and comments. So we want to thank you for that. So have a great evening, everyone. And we look forward to seeing some of you with us this weekend for um, Wave 24 and Family Weekend. Good night. Thank you, Penny. Bye-bye.